so my first question to you is what is linguism well linguism is a form of uh, discrimination based on language so it's uh, for example if you're discriminating a person uh, at an exam for example in university uh, because of uh, a person's language competence uh, and not based on other factors on the person's uh, ability to express uh, one's knowledge or discuss it. so it's it's a form of discrimination based on language have i answered your question is that okay yes i think so uh, so uh, during your entire tenure as a student and uh, a teacher at the faculty have you seen features of linguism uh, personally on the context of your friends and peers or students yes yes uh, there are several i mean uh, rather than uh, talk about some of the research we have done i would uh, i could reflect on the sort of experiences people had now in these instances uh, the discrimination uh, it might not be explicit this stated but if the student feels discriminated i think that's the crucial factor to, t- to consider so we had instances of uh, of some of my batchmates who used to take a whole hour just to read one page of cunningham's anatomy and there used to be several who wanted to give up some used to cry uh, because invariably they had to go home and uh, or their hostel and they would open their dictionary and go word by word uh, trying to understand the text now so that's a, we haven't really catered to that need so in a sense they're not being sensitive now we might say that it's that so many years ago but this happens even now because when we mentor students uh, you get the impressions and you get uh, their views and uh, certainly they do to a lesser degree now because english is uh, more uh, you know it's, it's more prevalent it's being used more often now and television or that is the social media but nevertheless uh, when it comes to technical language when it comes to technical terms latin words which we use and so on, uh, there is that they feel that discrimination so that's one aspect and uh, there was a study which we did that we uh, looked at student perceptions uh, and this was published in the cmj some time ago again 10 15 years ago but there again the students mentioned how they had been ridiculed for making errors in english errors in grammar now that again you occasionally hear about that even now where students uh, feel that they have been uh, they have been uh, laughed at or made fun of uh, because they've made an error in english so this uh, the, the, there's a huge body of evidence uh, done by sociologists on the role of kadu i mean it's a, it's if you, if you use that term and google you get several papers where english fluency is being used to discriminate uh, you know for social discrimination that's why it is called kadu because it's it cuts you from uh, from achieving certain uh, uh, you know social mobility could be affected so yes uh, from student onwards uh, we've uh, had uh, we noticed it we observed it and even in recent times uh, i have had students who say that it's uh, it's a shame to make errors in english they feel uh, very uh, very frightened to make mistakes in public and so on so it is that from the students point of view there is language discrimination and uh, we have to do some affirmative action there. if the students our main consumers are feeling then we have to do something about it so i think to start off with that is linguist or perceived linguist Uh, so uh, so deriving from your answer to my question uh, do you think when uh, there is some kind of a stigma uh, attached to uh, 
uh, non-standard English, if I may use that term, because people feel that they are a sort of a standard English and when a person is ridiculed, that is because they are deviating from it. Uh, do you think uh, those who uh, uh, resist non-standard English are merely being gatekeepers for the standard of English only? Or is it something else? I think it's something else because uh, if you really want to help a person correct his English, then you don't laugh at that person, you correct the person. Uh, but here you get, uh, you find people making comments, uh, sometimes uh, nasty comments or making fun at people. And also it's, it's very interesting because uh, in, in the, when you speak to some people outside the medical profession, uh, one comment is they would say, ah, English band. he can't speak English properly, his English is poor. So that sort of comment, uh, almost to say that all doctors should be fluent in English. And if you are not fluent, that means your competency as a doctor is also being questioned. Uh, so that's, again, I don't have data, but I think that's the impression you get. Uh, people seem to mix English competency with clinical competence. And uh, I don't think that's correct. Right. Uh, so, uh, uh, what is uh, the actual experience in your observation for long years uh, of a student who has studied in uh, maybe English, so, sorry, maybe uh, in uh, Sinhala or Tamil, entering into a highly demanding uh, course such as medicine? Uh, what sort of a, uh, intellectual burden or a educational burden uh, do they face uh, when they uh, face this transformation from uh, the language of A-levels to the language of study in the medical college? I think it's a huge burden, especially at the beginning when, you, uh, when you're faced with a new environment, uh, new friends, uh, you're some, some of them are away from home and uh, you are among strangers. For the first time uh, you're out of uh, your school environment or your village or your city or town and in addition to that you have to handle this huge cognitive load. Leaving all that aside uh, that is uh, an extra cognitive load because they do, uh, the, the, the usual format is where they listen in English then they translate it and try to understand it in Sinhalese and then you, when you're asked a question, you answer, you think of it in Sinhala, translate it in English and then express it. The same goes with Tamil. So you are having so many translations. Uh, now, this has to have an effect and uh, uh, I'm sure that would add to a cognitive load and personally, I'm supposed to be a content specialist and I've challenged uh, several teachers with this. You are assumed to be a content specialist. Give the lecture in Singhala now, uh, right? Hepatitis, you lecture now on hepatitis and you will start to struggle. So being a content specialist, very fluent in delivering those lectures, I am finding it difficult to switch to Singhala and lecture. Now imagine a student not fluent in the subject, not fluent in the language, having got to translate and then express it. So this is one major problem with, for example, Viva, because uh, when you do a Viva in, in uh, English, uh, you're adding a huge cognitive load and with the stress, with the anxiety, and the fact that they are not content specialists. And the students, we have, we've done it for years and years and we struggle so you can imagine the struggle they have so yes cognitive load is has to be we thank you for this conversation um, please don't go away thank you Conversation with Professor Sarun Jayasinghe. Sir, uh, to ask a quick question before we move on with the program, are there any areas in the education of health professionals that need attention 
in terms of reducing the adverse impact of the kadua or the english that discriminates thank you very much uh, thank you for inviting me uh, i think yes uh, that you know there are a whole set of uh, steps uh, we could take in relation to making it easy the transition uh, and uh, you know for example when we set questions and when we ask questions we have to ensure that it's it's we are trying to find their knowledge not their fluency and that can be a bit difficult uh, and uh, that's that sort of thing which teachers can do and also you know it's very strange uh, in sri lanka uh, students uh, go to uh, i'll take an example of a sinhala student sinhala student goes and meets a sinhala patient takes the history presenting complaint and everything in sinhala and then translates it into english and writes down the history and tells me another sinhalese person the translation of what that patient told uh, i think that is in a sense that's absurd because you are losing the richness of the history you lose the details uh, you know if when the person describes mang evidino kota hatama bhagayak yana kota sir khatiye enne i'm getting softness of breath when i walk about quarter mile or so that's translated mutilated and uh, given to us as this patient complains of shortness of breath on exertion uh, so you've lost the uh, plot uh, so i think uh, there are things we can do to enrich this uh, these interactions i'm not saying that we should suddenly switch everything to singular but i think this uh, this barrier should be less or broken down so that people feel comfortable in whatever language they speak we often get this uh, you know this happens even in colombo where we say small group discussions should be conducted in english now i don't know whether it happens now now there the whole idea is to discuss and the students should be free to discuss in whatever language we have to force that if you want them to learn english take them out of the small group discussion you have a separate uh, situation where they learn english and those who want to learn during the small group and want to learn let them do that that's okay uh, but we shouldn't be as teachers we shouldn't be imposing uh, on an intellectual discussion by saying that the intellectual discussion should happen in a particular language and we know that native language is or your mother tongue is how you develop your uh, concepts and so on have i answered your question or yeah yes sir thank you thank you very interesting and important perceptions from uh, professor rajaj singh thank you sir